Hello everyone. Here I'm going to discuss box plots, which are sometimes called box and whisker plots. I'm not going to work through any calculations. I'm going to discuss what the plots look like, what they are, and how to interpret them. We almost always use software to create them. A box plot is a plot of a quantitative variable. And here's a basic one. I'm going to discuss vertical box plots, like this one, with the quantitative variable on the vertical axis. But you might also see them plotted horizontally, like this. Everything I say about vertical box plots applies to horizontal box plots, if you turn your head to the side. In their simplest form, like you see here, a box plot is a plot of the five number summary. It contains these five pieces of information. Q1 is the first quartile, also known as the 25th percentile. Q3 is the third quartile, or the 75th percentile. I'm going to assume you've already been introduced to these quantities and you know what they mean. A box plot starts off with a box, with the 25th percentile at the bottom of the box. 25% of the observations in the data set are less than or equal to the value at the bottom of the box. Here, the 25th percentile is 48 or so. The 75th percentile is the top of the box. 75% of the observations are less than or equal to the value at the top of the box. Here, the 75th percentile is 52 or so. There's a line through the box at the median, also known as the 50th percentile. Note that the median might lie anywhere between the 25th and 75th percentiles. It doesn't have to be right in the middle of the box. For us, the width of the box will be meaningless. We just choose a width that looks reasonable, and software defaults usually do a decent job of that. It might look a little silly if the box was too skinny, like this, or too fat, but the width doesn't have any meaning for us other than visual appeal. Some people like to let the width have meaning, such as letting the box width be a function of the sample size, but we're not going to do that. We'll look only at the most common method, where the width is meaningless. If there are no extreme values, sometimes called outliers, then the whiskers extend from the box to the largest and smallest observations. More on outliers in a minute. So here's the minimum, right around 44 or so. And here's the maximum, right around 57. Done and done. That's a box plot. That was if there are no outliers. But if we have outliers, those extreme values that are sometimes present, then a box plot drawn in this fashion might give a bit of a distorted view. Suppose we use this plotting method and end up with something that looked like this. We might ask ourselves what's going on between the 75th percentile, the top of the box, and the maximum. It could be all sorts of different things. Maybe the values bunch close to the 75th percentile with a single extreme value up top. Maybe there are a bunch of values up closer to the maximum. Maybe something else. One or more extreme values could result in a very long whisker, making it a little tough to interpret the plot. So we use the argument that the whiskers shouldn't be too long, and that if we have extreme values, if we have those outliers, then they should be plotted in individually. I'm going to discuss a rule now that sounds arbitrary, like we just pulled it out of our hat. But there is some thought behind it, and overall it works reasonably well in applied settings. Recall that the interquartile range is the distance between the first and third quartiles. That's the length of the box. We're going to say that the length of each whisker can't be longer than 1.5 times the interquartile range. Again, that's a somewhat arbitrary rule, but it works reasonably well. Outliers are drawn in individually. It might be with lines, circles, asterisks, or some other symbol. Let's see what that looks like here. Under this new rule, the top whisker stops at the largest value that is not greater than Q3 plus 1.5 times the interquartile range. Anything larger than that is considered an outlier by this rule. Here we have two large outliers. The top whisker stopped at the third largest observation, 
it lies within 1.5 times the interquartile range of that third quartile. The bottom whisker stops at the smallest value that is not less than Q1 minus 1.5 times the interquartile range. Anything smaller than that is considered an outlier by this rule. Here, there are no outliers on the low end, so the bottom whisker stopped at the smallest value. This is far from the only outlier rule in statistics. There are many different rules and guidelines used in different situations. But this is a commonly used rule in box plots, and it's pretty reasonable. Box plots do give some indication of the shape of the distribution. More on that in a moment but they are more important for visually comparing the distribution of a quantitative variable between groups. Let's look at a real-world example of that. An experiment investigated jumping characteristics of the mangrove rivulus, a small amphibious fish that can jump on land by flipping its tail. I'll put a link to a video of these little guys jumping in the description, and the reference for this study will be there as well. In this experiment, some fish were kept in water, some out of water, and after two weeks in these conditions, they were subjected to a jumping boat. There were 26 fish in each group. One of the measured variables was total distance each fish traveled before the little guys became exhausted and stopped jumping. Here are side-by-side -side box plots for the 26 distance measurements in each treatment group. The major takeaways here are that it looks like the air-treated group tended to jump farther, since the boxes shifted upwards a bit. And the air group also had greater variability in their total jumping distance, since there appears to be greater spread in the observations. Later on, we might use statistical inference techniques to investigate that, seeing if we have strong evidence that the air-treated group does indeed jump farther on average. Much more on that type of thing later. For now, we're just doing a visual assessment. Note that we might have more than two groups that we wish to compare. In this experiment, there were actually three groups, the water group, the air group, and a group that was kept in air for a while, then put back in water, known as the recovery group. Here's the side-by-side -side box plots for all three treatment groups that were in this experiment. Side-by-side -side box plots like this allow us to visually compare the distribution of the quantitative variable for any number of groups. Another thing to note here is that these three box plots show some indication of right skewness. The plots are stretched out a little towards the top, towards the larger values. I think histograms are usually a little better at illustrating the shape of the distribution of the data, but box plots do give us some indication of the shape. Let's compare a few histograms and box plots to get a little better feel for what box plots tell us about the shape. Here's a histogram of some data that has an approximately symmetric distribution. The sample size is 200 here. The left and right sides of this histogram are, roughly, mirror images. Take a few seconds to try and visualize what the box plot will look like here. This is the box plot for the same data. Note that the histogram has the variable on the horizontal axis, but the box plot has the variable on the vertical axis. Here, the box plot looks symmetric as well. The median is roughly halfway between the first and third quartiles, roughly in the middle of the box, and the whiskers are roughly of equal length. The top and bottom of the box plot are roughly mirror images. Note that there is no way to tell the sample size by looking at the box plot. We can tell from the histogram, when the histogram has frequency as the vertical axis, but there is no way to tell the sample size from the box plot alone. Now suppose we have a histogram that looks like this, with some right skewness, also po called positive skewness. Take a few seconds to try and visualize what the corresponding box plot will look like. This is the box plot for the same data. This box plot is indicative of right skewness. It's stretched out toward the top. We see the median closer to the bottom of the box than the top. In other words, the median is closer to the first quartile than the third, and we see the top whisker being longer than the bottom. We also see a few large outliers. It might be a little bit more straightforward to compare them if we rotated the box plot 90 degrees clockwise so we get a horizontal box plot, like this. 
It looks like the histogram stretched out to the right. And of course, with left skewness, it's in the other direction. Here's a histogram indicating left skewness and the corresponding box plot. We see that the histogram is stretched out toward the left side, and the box plot is stretched out downwards. So box plots can give an idea of the shape of the distribution of the data. But again, the killer application of box plots is in the comparison of the distribution of the variable between different groups. We'll often look at box plots of different groups to get a visualization of what's going on before carrying out our statistical inference procedures. One last thing. With box plots, the number of outliers that we see is very much related to the sample size. To illustrate, here I've sampled 200 observations from a normal distribution, a distribution that is symmetric and bell-shaped. We'll talk a lot more about the normal distribution later, but it's something we commonly see in practice, at least approximately. The corresponding box plot for these 200 observations shows three outliers. For a little perspective, it turns out that when sampling fairly large samples from a normal distribution, on average roughly 1% of observations would be considered outliers according to our box plot rule. Here we ended up with three outliers in a sample of 200, which is roughly what we'd expect to see. Now let's draw a much larger sample, 10 times as large with 2,000 observations, and see what that looks like. Here the histogram and box plot look very similar to what we saw for the smaller sample, but there are more outliers in the box plot. That tends to happen when you draw a larger and larger sample. You'll get more and more extreme values. Here there are nine outliers, which might look like a lot at first glance, but having nine outliers in a sample of 2,000 isn't a lot. So in addition to the visual aspects of the box plot, always keep the sample size in mind. What to do with outliers is a discussion for another time. But if they're only mild outliers, and not too extreme, like what we see here, then generally they aren't a major cause for concern. More extreme outliers can be more problematic. That's it for now.